Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Afternoon, my name is Ames. I'm an alcoholic. It's a great honor for um, somebody to ask me to speak on AA's 70th birthday and for uh, <clears throat> for somebody to even ask me that that just you know blew me away I've uh, owed my uh, life as it is today to the program Alcoholics Anonymous it's changed uh, the way uh, a person completely from uh, from being you know I I used to say I I hated white people then I thought about it you know and I, I hated about everybody, you know, equally. And, and, uh, I wasn't prejudiced, I just hated everybody, you know, and, and, uh, and I didn't, I didn't love, like the situation I grew up in. A lot of things happened that, before I was born, that, that shaped my life, and I was brought into that world, and I, I always, always said, you know, if, if you was the way, you know, in my situation, and, and uh had to face the things I faced, you'd be an alcoholic too. But uh I uh I came to Las Vegas with that attitude, I was forever a victim. And I could always uh pawn, you know, put it off saying, Well I'm an Indian. If if you was Indian like me then, you know, all that stuff you, you could understand I drank, you know, and and uh I was two years dry when I got here. And uh I ended up in this uh I was kind of lost. This Thai club used to have two buildings, and and in the back was this uh, dilapidated part of Thai club, and there was some old benches, that, you know, old couches that were real sunk down and uh, all, you know, smoky, and all the old farts in there always looked like they were fighting, ready to fight, you know, arguing. And I had this friend that took me to that meeting, and. Uh, George was part of that group, you know, they, and they, they started taking this victim stuff right out of me. I always explain, well, there's ten of us in my family, and nine are alcoholic. You know, the one that didn't drink should be drinking, and, um, you know, and, and, uh, they'd say, well, what about the one that didn't drink? Did she ever go to jail? And I said, no. In fact, I said, uh, she finished college and she's working for IBM. So she's never drank and she's never gone to jail. Never done the stuff you've done. The nope, they said, well, then, then not all Indians are alcoholics. You know? And then they, they said, uh, Amos, you know what? You're dying from alcoholism. You're not dying from Indianism. You know? And, and they, and they started taking the, the, the victimization out of me. And, and I didn't like that. You know, I get a lot of mileage out of being a victim. You know? I could get away with stuff. You know? But, what, what, what these guys done is they, they started just making me a little bit more honest. Making me more, a little bit more responsible for my actions. A little bit more responsible for, uh, going to work on time. You know, going, uh, doing the things I gotta do, like pay my rent. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and I'd, I'd come in with these all kinds of stories and they'd, they'd laugh and say, you know what? <laughs> he must, you can tell it to somebody else, but you ain't gonna tell that to us, you know. We know you too good. <clears throat> so, th- that started to change in me. You know, I was, I was full of fear. I was, I was full of hatred. I was full of anger. And I was, you know, scared most of the time of things I couldn't do anything about. But what these guys done to me is that they introduced me to the program Alcoholics Anonymous and, and started doing the steps. And they started, uh, the process of Learning there's a higher power in my life and, uh, and that if I, if I learn to do the right things and learn to trust in Him, things will work out. And then, uh, it's been a long process. You know, I've, I've, I've learned how to get a life as a result of these guys. You know, my life was, uh, beer joints and back alleys and blood banks and day labor and jail. In anything between that, you know, and uh, through these guys, you know, uh, they they started uh, 
He started the process of making me a, a more responsible person, not necessarily a better person, you know. That comes with time. Uh, now I'll kind of give you where I came from. I came from the uh, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. It's in the southwest corner of South Dakota. And uh, growing up there, I didn't know it was such a horrible place because it was just normal. That everybody drank on every, any weekend. You know, it was not, not not safe to be around my house or anywhere near the vicinity. You know, I got, I'm the sixth brother. There's five older brothers than me, and they're all bigger than me and meaner, and, and, you know, because I learned how to run quickly, you know, when I was a kid. I learned how to hide and I learned to duck. You know? And uh, one of my brother's biggest biggest uh, recreation was cleaning out a bar on the weekend, you know. That's what he liked to do for fun, you know. And uh, my dad was alcoholic, my mom. The only one that didn't drink that I know was my sister and my grandma. And my, my grandma was one of the probably the cornerstones of my life. And uh, we didn't know how old grandma was. You say, Grandma, how old are you? She said, 89. She was 89 for about 20 years. So <laughs> you know, we didn't know how old she was. But she could tell you back before the white guys came to our part of the country. You know, and and she could talk all day long. She talking our we we call it Sioux. It's Lakota, you know, the language. So I didn't, I didn't talk English till I went to school. And, and uh, I thought, you know, uh, and she'd tell us all kinds of stories, you know, and I respected grandma, cause she had a cane, and, you know, and, 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 and he didn't listen to grandma, she'd lay it on side of you, you know, on side of your head. You know, she didn't, there were ten of us in our family, so my mom didn't know counseling or any of that kind of stuff. Either you didn't, you did it or you was on the ground, you know. And, uh, you know, on weekends, my older brothers go to, they worked all week, on weekends they'd go to town and then they see who they get in a fight with at the bar, and if they didn't, couldn't find anybody there, they'd come home and get in a fight with each other, you know. And then my dad would be refereeing, you know, and, and I'm saying, man, this is, I don't know if this is normal living, but that's, that's the way I grew up. And, uh, you know, it was okay, I don't know if it was okay or not, but, I was, uh, the, the U.S. government formed this branch of government called the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And their job was to make us white guys, to assimilate us into society. And the BIA, we call it Boss Indians Around, you know. And, and, uh, they, their, their job was to make you a white guy. How could you do that, you know? Hundreds of years of culture and everything like that. You're supposed to become a white guy within about two or three weeks, two or three weeks, you know. <laughs> How that could happen for, they take you to, I went to this boarding school, I just turned six years old, and, and they said, okay, first of all, they lined us up, just like a boot camp, you know, took your clothes away from you, shaved your ball, and then, uh, assigned you numbers and gave you beds, and, and then the first thing they say is, well, you, you can't talk your language anymore. You gotta learn how to speak English. And then you get, you get, uh, you get punished pretty bad for speaking your language. And then the next thing they did is, okay, whatever beliefs you had, you don't got them anymore. They, they all lined us all up like in a row. They said, you guys are Episcopals and you guys are Catholics. I was like, what the hell Episcopal is? But it, it was bad, you know? <laughs> I was gonna go someplace for being a human being, you know? Someplace hot, someplace, someplace horrible. And, and, and I'm a boy, I got thoughts, okay? You know? And then I'm supposed to go to some place I couldn't even understand what the, this thing is. But every, every, uh, every weekend they make us get me those suits and they march us down to this church and then tell us about how we're gonna go to this burning inferno, you know? For, for things we didn't even know we'd done. And, and then they'll go back and then they tell us, uh, your culture's no good. You know, your language is no good. You're gonna have to learn this English language. You're gonna have to learn to work. You're gonna have to do all this stuff. And you're supposed to accomplish that. And then when you get out of there, you're supposed to go out there in society and then start being a productive human being, right? Well, it don't work. 
First of all, when they start doing that stuff to you, you start getting what, this, what you call self-loathing. You start getting what you call low self-esteem. You start hating yourself for who you are. And you got no, no, nothing, no, nothing to do with this stuff. And it prepared me to a life of an, of an alcoholic. Because I had no higher power. I had no, no, nobody to turn to when I, when I get through these situations where most normally you say, okay, it's God's will. Me, I say it's, cur- and the damn curse of Columbus should have never got lost, you know. <laughs> you know? Or it's, it's the U.S. government, or the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or the cops, you know. I, I never knew that my actions would get me in these situations. And, uh, <clears throat> I ended up, you know, I finished that, that, uh, boarding school. I, I, I graduated high school, and I barely graduated the last two years. I, mean, I barely did the last two years, you know. Because by that time, my mom passed away, and I didn't have nowhere to go on weekend, on, on during the week, I mean, during the school. So I'd go back to the boarding school and hang out just because I had nowhere to go. And uh, so I graduated. And what, what do you think I did when I graduated? I drank. I was drinking hard by then. So I, I a couple of few of my brothers uh, lived in Denver. And uh, they were on their way down. And they drank at a place called Larimer Street. You know. And I went down, I was 18 years old, 19 years old when I was down Larimer Street. I loved it down there. Yeah, it was just a free for all, <laughs> 24 hours a day. And, uh, I did you know, uh, cause it still worked for me at times, that, the alcohol. It still worked for me. It still took away the, the situations I was in. It took, it took away reality for a time being. And I was down there for, off and on the streets like that. And for the next 10 years, you know, I got all kinds of scars and, <laughs> you know, I don't, I'm lucky I'm alive, you know. And, um, in, in that time I went from, uh, let's see, I went down to California. Then I went to Phoenix. I went to Albuquerque. I went back to Denver. All in that situation. Always in the same situation. Always like two notches up above the street. Always, always like, Having a couple, two, three warrants over my head. I was looking over my shoulder. Cops are looking for me. You know, I went to an, uh, one of these big shot AA meetings one time. They asked this question. When do you, they asked, the question is, uh, when do you uh, think you got to move, right? I said, that's easy. When you got more warrants than you could pay, you know. That's when you move, you know. <laughs> you know, and uh, I, I just lived that way. I didn't know that there was another way of living. I didn't know. My, my whole family were alcoholics. Everywhere I went, there was an alcoholic. Uh, and when there was a situation, I settled it the way I was doing. I either ran, I got drunk, and I always ended up in trouble. And um, I, I wish I could tell you different, but that's the way I grew up. A lot of my people grew up that way. On that, in the, on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, the average age, the the age that the people live is like 40 years old. That's the longest they're going to live. And most of that's going to be in misery. And it's one of the biggest ghettos you've ever seen. It's like 100 miles or 150 miles long. And most people die by the time they're in their 30s because of this disease, car accidents, death, uh, shootings, knifings, uh, freezing to death. Most of the guys I went to high school with are dead. And, you know, I'm 51 now. I go back, they call me an elder. You know, and that's, 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 that's kind of bad because then I'm only 51 and most people don't make it my age. That's a bad disease. It's, it's, it'll kill most, most of my people. And I'm, I'm really fortunate that, that I ended up where I did in Alcoholics Anonymous. And then, you know, uh, I ended up standing on a street corner. I, I lived two blocks off of Larimer Street under a tree, and uh, that was my home. And there, it was a good morning. I'd get up and I'd have a jug of white port that I kind of choked down, and I'd go down and start blaming everybody else for where I'm at. But that morning I was standing. I didn't have a, I didn't have any, so I was standing in the corner with my buddies, the boys, you know, at the corner. And here somebody scored a jug, white port. And, uh, passed it around and I took a drink and it went down and I was just, I hit my stomach and I was, just, eyes are watering and then I didn't want to throw it up and it's coming out of my nose. And, 
You know, and if you hold it down, then maybe the magic will hit. And then you could start saying, okay, and damn Christopher Columbus, you know. And he started blaming everybody else. And But that morning, it did stay down, but I, you know, I was tired. I started looking around and started seeing, I've been doing this stuff all my life, you know. And I'm tired and I'm sick and I'm, I don't want to do this anymore, you know. And, I'm, and uh, you know, in Alcoholics Anonymous, they say there's a higher power. And he intervenes, you know, in, in people. And in the big book it says about this Eskimo is going to show up. Well, my my Eskimo was another buddy of mine, Sioux Indian. He show, he's calling me from across the street, and I lost my glasses. So I couldn't see who it was, but in my situation, you don't go across the street. Somebody's calling you. And you probably did something wrong, you know. You probably stole something or did something. And uh, he... he uh, so I went over there for some reason that morning. It was Harley. Harley said, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. <laughs> you know so where's, where's your daughter? I said, I don't know. You know What you going to do? I, I really don't know. You know. And uh, He said, you know, uh, I've been sober 14 months. And that blew me away because Harley and I, we drank together. We, we drank hard. I only claim the fame is we got kicked out of every bar we've ever been in. And... and uh, and he even got kicked out of the parking lots too, you know. The people just didn't want us around. And and uh, he uh, he said, if you go to this place called Eagle Lodge for 30 days, I'll help you get a job, and we'll go find your daughter, you know. And I had no no ideas, so I said okay. And I, you know, uh, I went into this uh, place called Denver Saves. You know this. Detox we down there got down there is a good detox compared to Denver Cares, you know. It's a room, a big old warehouse, converted warehouse, they have cots lined up just like just like a warehouse, you know, and they have uh people in there, they just house you men and women together, you know, and, and uh, you go in there and you uh they they detox, you know, they take your clothes away, give you a shower, they louse you, and then they give you these pajamas on. And then you go over there and you detox however long it takes. And they have doctors and nurses and stuff available to, you know, help you out, get through that. And uh, <clears throat> and I was, you know, every time I bent over, man, it was bad. You know, I drank for about a year straight that time. You know? And I went in there and I, and I, I was sick. I, I, I just couldn't hardly move. And uh, I was there about three days when it when, when the other, the other thing that happened in my life is that the other part of Alcoholics Anonymous came is, is, uh, I was laying there and I was looking around and I said, what are you doing here, you know? I thought you started out to do better than this. And then it hit, hit me that, you know what, Amos, you drink too much. When you drink, you don't care. You don't really give a shit. And you go to the end of the door to get another one. And, uh, that time they brought these AA meetings and, and I went to one and, didn't really sink in, but I knew these guys were happy, you know, and I knew they were they were laughing, you know. And after the AA meeting, they'd get in their car and go home. You know, they were paying their bills. And if you give me any money at that period of time, I wouldn't pay no bill. <laughs> I'd go down to the corner liquor store, and uh, yeah, that was the appeal of Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of the things that happened to me, I was standing there in line with this guy to eat, and. Uh, I was talking to him, I turned back around, and I turned back around, and his eyes rolled up, and he hit the dirt, and he was just flopping all over the place. And the ambulance came, and they took him away, and then when they brought him back, he couldn't talk. He went through a seizure, and he couldn't talk anymore, he could barely walk. And it just, he's the same age as me, and it just scared me. It's one of the things that made me think that I drink just as, I was drinking the parks with him, I drink just like him. There, I, there he is, he can't walk, or he can't hardly talk. And I started realizing that, you know what, <laughs> I need to do what these guys say in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. I know, I need to know, find out what these guys do to make them be happy and make them have a life. So, from there I went to the Eagle Lodge Alcoholic Treatment Center and, uh, <clears throat> you know, and I'm, I'm real prejudiced. I, you know, I've worked hard on this for a lot of years, you know. And one of my best friends sitting out there is a cowboy, you know. Indian hugging a cowboy. What's it? <laughs> you know, that's good. But I was, every time I go to an AA meeting, I'm the only Indian there, right? And so I'm always, okay, there, there's my excuse, you know, this, 
AA is for white guys only. So I said, oh, well, there's my excuse. And so there I was storming through the book. They said, I have this book, right? And I was storming through it. And then I opened to this uh, chapter called Join the Tribe, in third edition. And then and there it says uh, that there's a guy named Maynard. He was in there. And then it just hit me and I said, you know what? If he's in there and he could do this, I can try it too. And I could, and he says, just keep it real simple. He says, uh, if, uh, Indi- Indians get crazy when they're drunk, you know, join the tribe, <laughs> you know. I'm sure all of us got crazy when they got drunk, you know. And so, you know, and, uh, so I started going to AA. And then, uh, some people, they don't care about us people. One of them was my counselor and she said, yeah, she talked to me for a long time. She said, you know, you seem to be a pretty intelligent guy, Amos. I said, yeah, but I keep messing up, you know. Every time I almost finish something, every time I'm close to doing something, I get drunk. And I, I, I had such low self-esteem, you know. She said to me, she said, you're not a bad guy, Amos. And that's the first time in my life somebody told me I'm not a bad guy. My jaw dropped down to my chin. and I, She said, you're an alcoholic. You got a disease, a disease. But you can pretty much do what it takes in this world to... Go look for your daughter and finish school and do all that stuff you want to do. If you don't take a drink and you go to work and you do the things that you got to do. So they talked me into going back to college. You know, and I'm, I'm 30 years old and they, I went back to college, you know, and, and I was the oldest one in my class and they call, and they call me pops, you know, and, you know, and, but I said, man, ain't nobody had a second chance like me for all the, all the years I've been on the streets and I had a chance to go back to college. I went back. <clears throat> And I used to be really good in, 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 in the classroom when I was paying attention, you know, and, uh, but you know, I went back to school, I couldn't read anymore, you know, and I had a hard time with comprehension. All those, all those blows to the head and all those, all the drinking and all the stuff that I'd done, I couldn't, couldn't retain stuff. So what, what I did was I stayed up all night. I still have a hard time sleeping. I only sleep three or four hours a night, but I stayed up all night and I, Studied and restudied and wrote it down, redid it over and over again. And, uh, I didn't have any money because I done messed up the tribal funding more than once. So I, I used to, on, uh, well, uh, a couple times a week I'd go down to this place called, uh, the plasma. So my first semester when I went back to school, I sold my plasma twice a week. I get my shampoo, my, uh, toothbrush and all that stuff. But, uh, Towards the end of the first semester, I started started comprehending a little bit, but then uh, the grades came out and I made the president's list. You know, I was staying up all night, and then they did it did a couple more times, and when then when I was ready to graduate, this is how I ended up in Vegas. I applied to these companies like IBM and all these uh, fancy companies, and they they look at my resume and then call up and look at my jail record, and and uh, they. They'd say, okay, thanks for, uh, thanks for your interest, you know, and then they kind of forget about me, you know. And I must have put over, over 100 applications and I got turned down every time. And I was ready, I was ready to go back to Denver and I know I could work on TV, so I went back to school for electronics, technician, and, uh, just before I was gonna go back, my, my instructor said, there's somebody coming from Vegas and, uh, I want you to go talk to him for me. And I said, well, he really treated me good, you know, this instructor, he treated me like a human being, so I thought, well, okay, I'll just do it for him, you know. And I was just going to go with just a regular t-shirt and stuff on, that's how I dress normally. And they said, no, he must, my roommates got together and made a, <laughs> put a suit together for me. And I, was, I guess that's the first time I wore a suit most of my life, and I, I went to the interview, and they had a big old long line of people, you know, and these guys were all Air Force vets, and you name it, and uh, I was like the second guy there because I'd never hardly sleep, you know. Those sprinklers come on early. You're living in the parks, you know, and, and I was like the second guy there, you know. And uh, so they, uh, this guy went, and then then I went, and then he looked at my stuff, you know, and he started looking at, it and he says, Ah, I see you've been around a lot. And I said, You know, I raised my, <laughs> I said, You know what? Well, I need to get this over with, you know. I know I ain't gonna pass this interview anyway, so I, I told him I'm an alcoholic. You know what? I'm an alcoholic. And he said, 
He looked at me for a while and he said, uh, what made you stop? I said, well, uh, I ain't, I'm not getting any younger. I'm almost 30 years old and I'm never going to get any better. And uh, he said, okay. So uh, how long has it been? Uh, almost a couple of years now. And he said, okay. And then he started asking me for the technical questions and I, I passed them. And then he said, okay, thanks. So I went out of there and I said, oh, no, I ain't going to get this. And I just like two months before I graduated, so I was getting, making plans going back up to Denver. And, and here, uh, four days later, this guy called back and wanted more information on me. He said, I'm going to send you a pack, fill out so we can, uh, we can, uh, consider your application, right? So they sent me a pack and it was this thick. It's about an inch thick, you know. And they said, where have you been in the last 15 years? <laughs> That's one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. <laughs> Trying to figure out where I've been in the last 15 years, you know. <laughs> and then it says, uh, list all the jobs you've had in the last 15 years. <laughs> I said, okay, well, let's see. I've been self-employed a lot, you know. <laughs> you know? And then the, the next thing they says, is, list all the times you've been in jail, right? <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> After about the second page, I got tired and went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> then I put, if I did it, if it's, you know, if it's there, I probably did it, you know, and then I, I then I fill it all out and I send it in and I said, now for sure they're not going to hire me, you know. And about two weeks later, they, they send an application, I mean, a uh, offer in the mail. This company is called EG&G, if anybody ever heard of the company. And uh, I, uh, so I said, okay, I send it back and, and, uh, they paid for my move out here. I'm still there. Same company. You know, it's, uh, it's over almost 19 years now, you know, and um, next year I could retire if I want to. You know, that's coming from the streets, living under a tree to, you know, next year I can start drawing pension and do something else. You know, alcoholics and I was all the time. I went to meetings every day, sometimes three or four times a day on Saturdays. Cause I don't know how to live without taking a drink. And these guys taught me how to how to go through situations without taking a drink, how, how to face life without getting too stressed out, how to not get in physical confrontations. <laughs> that was my answer, you know. And, and and how to how to pay my bills. You know, I I didn't know anything about benefits. This guy uh, George was talking about catfish. I thought benefit was a free meal, right? So I showed up at this job and they gave me a pack of this thing thick and they say okay you get this insurance that insurance you do this you do that that was way over my head I went over and give it to catfish and catfish looked at it said, you don't want this you don't want that you know just throwing all this stuff out and, and so you got to save 16 percent or 16 dollars 16 percent I don't know which one but he's put it sign it down so I've been doing that all these years paying them you know and um in 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 the meantime there while I was doing all that I uh I came to Las Vegas and I started going to the men's downbeat group Monday night and I uh, and uh I would often wonder where my daughter was, you know. And they'd always say, you know what, you you gotta have faith in God. She'll show up when when the time is right. So I it took me like five years after I sobered up and I finally I finally found her. She was living in Winslow, and uh, <clears throat> like when I found her, she didn't know who I was. You know, I I got a chance to go pick her up on a, on a on a vacation. I went down there and I waited a day, and they brought her back from the reservation up there, and uh, she didn't know who I was, but they they told her that's your dad, you know. And so she got in the car with me, and you know, all my life before that, I always make promises to people to. Anybody, I'll do this and I'll do that. But if you put a drink in front of me, that promise is gone. I'd rather drink. And uh, so I took her down to Walmart and we started walking around. And I bought her some clothes. And she was looking at this bike, a little nice bike, with, you know, ribbons all over it. You could tell she wanted it, so I said, you can have it. And, uh, she, she didn't believe me. I grabbed it and I took it over to the checkout stand, and, you know, and... Uh, she just couldn't believe it, you know. I said, yeah, you know. And then uh, we went to vacation up there in uh, Denver. She didn't know me, you know. She she just knew me as Amos. And she didn't even hug me. She just, like, 
tell me when she's hungry, tell me when she needs to go bathroom, you know, and uh, we got up to Denver and went to visit my sister for a while, and, and we went all over Colorado, you know, and not down Skid Row where I'm used to, you know, we went to the sites, you know, and, you know, and carnivals and stuff like that, and uh, and then on the way, way back, we stopped in Winslow and dropped her off, and she gave me a hug, you know, and, and then that was like in August, I mean, in <clears throat> July. And then I had contact with her, so I'd send her some money and I bought clothes and stuff. And I bought her school clothes. And that, that December, they said that I could keep her for the holidays. So I went after her. And when I got over there, they said, you want to keep her? You know? I said, yeah. So I brought her back. She was nine years old. You know, and uh, <clears throat> today she's 25. You know, and she's, I've raised her. You know, uh, you know, alcoholism runs deep. It's, it's very bad. It's an insidious disease. It'll kill you. And no matter how many times you've been in AA or whether you grew up in AA or not, she, she grew up in the front of a Thai club. And, uh, she used to hang out with Texas Mike and John Todman. One of them taught her how to stack a deck. I don't know which one did it, you know. But she's nine years old. She'd go and, you know, and I was thinking, where'd you learn that? And they also told her not to tell on anybody. <laughs> you know, she would never, never tell who did it, you know. And, but, uh, you know, uh, I got to be a soccer dad, you know, and we, we went all over taking vacations and everything. And, uh, her mom sobered up and started talking to her mom, and when she's 13, she ran away. You know, back, back down there. She's used to that chaotic lifestyle. It's, it's very hard to leave that. In the second step, it says her lifestyle seems the only normal one, even no matter how, how rough it is. And she went back, and, uh, and about a year or so later, you know, uh, I moved to Wyoming, one of my good ideas. And uh, she came to live with me, and I found out she was pregnant. She was 14, you know, and uh, she had a baby when she was 15. That, that's Lucas, you know. And, and then I had, you know, what am I going to do? Put the baby back, you know. You know, and I started raising him, taking care of him. And then uh, a couple of years later, she took off again. And then a while later, she came back, she had a little girl. That's that's Leah. <clears throat> She's seven. They live with me yet. You know? and they, uh, I have a good time with them guys, you know. I must be the same age as them mentally, because I sure have a good time. You know? <laughs> you know? We go fishing together, and we, we just have a good time, you know. And that's what it's about, you know, and having time and being able to laugh, being able to cry, being able to live, live life to the fullest. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, a couple of, four years ago, four and a half years ago, she came back, and she didn't say nothing. She just came back. I was just happy to have her back, and she didn't say nothing. She just started going to AA, you know. She's been to AA a lot of times, and she went and got working on her GD. And she started gaining a little weight, you know. And uh, how are you going to tell your daughter she's gaining weight, you know? So I said, you know what, I've got this corporate gym membership. <laughs> Go over there. She didn't say nothing. And then uh, it was like in the spring, she uh, she came with little gram things. That, I said, that's, that's a baby. And I said, Ooh, which one is that, Lucas or Leo? She said, that's a new one. She was pregnant again, you know. And didn't tell me. And, uh, the little baby was uh, born May 31st, four years ago. My dad didn't even show up. Dad didn't even try to show up. I was in the delivery room. And, uh, <clears throat> so the baby had my last name, you know, and, uh, so I, you know, took the baby home and everybody, all of my friends were there and, you know, and, uh, then, then my daughter had this, what you call, oh, some kind of, uh, syndrome. Just went in depression for a couple of months, and I had to really talk to her about, you know, you got to take care of these other guys, you know, you got to help her out, help these guys out. Postpartum you know, called, and finally I had to, you know, it's really hard being a parent. You really hard trying to get these kids to do something when their whole life's been chaotic. And uh, so I said, you know, I was buying a house, another house. So I said, you can have this one. And my job is right over there. You know, and, and then I'll be right over there if you need me. She didn't want to live alone. She said, I'm going to go to Albuquerque. 
and uh, among those two over there. So, as much as I hated to, my sponsor said she's an adult now. You got to take her. You know, so I took her down there, and he came from South Dakota to be with me at that time. And then, so I left her in Albuquerque, you know. And then, and then I, I had a tough time coming back. And this was like Labor Day, and she was up there a couple of months, and. Uh, I got a call on November 1st that the little baby passed away. With, uh, what do you call him? Sid, Sid's, you know, and that was tough. I'm telling you, I went to like depression for over almost three years, you know, because of guilt feelings of <clears throat> taking her down there. And, uh, but you know what? I went to AA every day. I went to work with sponsors. I, I did all the stuff that AA taught me to do that I could walk through this. And, uh, you know, uh, I finally was able to start talking about it last year. It took me over three years. Uh, I didn't have to drink over it because it's, AA says you don't have to drink over anything. You know, uh, job, no job, wife, no wife, deaths, anything like that. You don't have to drink over it. Because, because, uh, taking a drink is never going to bring anybody back. Taking a drink is never going to make the situation any better. And, uh, so, she finally came back last year. I had to kick her out because she couldn't stop drinking. And those little, little kids went back to her dad. I had to kick her out. I don't know where she went. And it's tough. It's tough when you have to rely on God. Cause you, but he's got more power than me. You know, I'm, he's infinite. His power is infinite and my, I don't have any power. I just gotta have to rely on him. And, uh, he did his job, you know, cause I just go to AA, that's my job, and help a newcomer. Don't drink. And one morning she showed up at AA meeting. And that, that was a year ago. I think she's got a year of sobriety now, you know. And, <clears throat> and then, uh, so we went after the little guys. They, they still remember me, you know. And they still hang around, you know, I still hang around them. Today, after this meeting, I gotta, I gotta take them down to Arizona because they're gonna go visit their grandma on the other side. For the summer, they're part, they're part Apache, so they got to go down to the White River, Arizona. You know what? I, I can do that. You know, because I can learn how to. The situation is different, and I, I can trust God today that everything's going to work out. I've never been able to do that one time. <clears throat> uh, so that's that's part of that. As far as my, you know, in, in my job, I even got a white guy working for me now. You know? <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know what? He loves me, you know? <laughs> I, every time I'm going to do something, boy, he runs all over trying to get it for me, you know? And, uh, and, and, and uh, they wonder, one of the worst things is they're going to take him away from me. Oh, man. You know? So I've got nine guys now, you know? And uh, um, it's, it's okay today. I don't have the the... Fantastic ups and fantastic downs. I'm kind of down in the middle with uh, alcohol, you know, with life in general. I know that no matter what happens, everything's going to be all right in the end. I didn't have that when I got in. I thought the world was going to end about ten minutes ago, you know. I thought that way all the time. <clears throat> i got a whole bunch of friends today. And I've had friends for years. You know. Back in the old days, I'd go through the three sets of friends on one weekend. <laughs> The only guys that never did kick me out were the cops, you know. They, they, they'd say, come on in, they must, you know, you know. And when I went to, when I went to treatment, that was, I was the first one in my family to go, go to, uh, treatment, I mean, go to AA. And every time, you know, uh, I'd go to this treatment place and some, some family members would come and they have a picnic, you know, on front and everybody would be all lovey-dovey and stuff and, boy, I'd, I'd get mad because, Never happened to me, you know. My family came to borrow money. <laughs> and then one of them would try to fight me if I didn't lend him money. You know, this is, this is a treatment, you know. And I'm saying, man, you know, there's no justice in this world, you know. But you know what they told me that no matter what, you gotta be sober. Because you may be the only example of a, a big book anybody will ever see. The fantastic thing is, you know, when, when my big brother Lester, the one that used to come to the treatment center, he died a couple of years ago. He was five years sober, you know. And then, and then I sobered up, and I was 
sitting there talking to my big brother. I was trying to explain to him how to find a higher power, trying to work on that. And he's looking at me funny, and he says, are you an AA? And I said, yeah. And he says, me too, you know. <laughs> and I got, I got three weeks on him, you know. And he's 10 years older than me. Uh, my last drink was February 2nd, 1984. I'm going on my 22nd year now. You know, I haven't been in jail in that long, too. That's that's good, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that's the, the good part. And then a little bit later, my sister was looking and she said, you know what, i got a year today. She's got she's going to have 20 years this year. And then all the rest of them start coming in, my brothers and sisters and stuff. And, and they're all sober now. Most of them, a lot of them don't go to AA, but they're all sober. And, you know, when, when we get together, back in the old days, there'd be at least two or three cop cars, the ambulance, and, you know, the fire truck, and somebody would always pass out with a cigarette or, you know, trying to cook and pass out, you know, and, and, uh, now last, in March, we had a family get together and a pizza truck showed up with about 30 pizzas, you know, you know, and we all laughed and had a good time. We're still friends. You know, in the old days, I didn't see a brother like five years, and I seen him, and we got in a fight the same night. <laughs> Something happened ten years ago, or twenty years ago, when I was a kid, I remember that, you know. And then we got into that over that, you know. Uh, ain't no, you know, they're all, uh, uh, paradise, but it's, it's, it's pretty close. It's pretty close for me. Alcoholics Anonymous has, uh, done stuff. It's transformed somebody that's hated everybody to where, I'm accepting, and, and I still don't like a lot of people, but I could live with that, you know. And uh, I'm uh, become a productive member of Alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous and society, you know. Uh, just uh, if you if you don't think it works, just believe that we, you know, that that we know it does. If you're a newcomer, they, they told me that uh, you go to meetings. First thing you gotta do is don't drink one day at a time. Okay? And then go to meetings, get a sponsor, get that book. So it's this one. It's the least read book around. And, you know, anyway, and, and, and then work with a newcomer. And you do those things on a daily basis, and then your life will turn around. Uh, I've, uh, I've had a lot of friends that passed on, in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've lost uh, three sponsors and passed away. Uh, I'm a fourth sponsor now, and uh, George has been my friend all this time, and uh, he's always supported me. Uh, we buried one of our good buddies last spring, Catfish. Catfish was two, two days short of his 35th birthday, but we decided he's going to have 35 anyway. <laughs> and uh, I was a uh, I was there for his, uh, for his, uh, funeral. I felt honored to be invited by his family. One of my sponsors passed away in Hawaii. But, you know, those guys showed me courage because they, they, they went through bad, through bad stuff, but they never complained. They were always grateful that they were members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they was always able to talk to me and always want to help me out if I needed something. <clears throat> and, uh, that's that's what these elders taught me. In my tribe, we got people that are, I'm one of them now, I guess, elder, that got good advice. And AA, we got the old timers, and they showed the way for us to to, to live sober and have a ha- happy, productive life. I generally go to the Thai club. It's my hangout. And uh, you can find me there sometime during the week. Yeah, I try I try to live honestly. I'm down to three lives a day. <laughs> if we believe that, I got rich as hell. You know? And, uh, uh, his 70th birthday, it could take anybody and make them, uh, something completely different. All you have to do is actions contrary to our thinking, you say. You know? Actions contrary to our thinking. And, uh, Thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill W., Dr. Bob, and all the old timers that carried this program on through dark times and to where it's now. Thank you very much.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.